Jamie, 40 here. There's a heartbreaking story on ESPN.com about Michael O'Hare, right? The protagonist of the terrific movie, The Blind Side. And he's now alleging that the white family that adopted him, right, have made millions and they've been operating in deceit and just a heartbreaking story. I mean, first of all, let's get some context of where Michael O'Hare was at. All right. So he was one of 13 siblings from the nation's third poorest zip code, right? The Tuis, the white family, the evangelical Christian family that effectively adopted him, right, were affluent. All right. So Michael O'Hare was on track to be selling drugs. He was en route to jail or to an early grave. His father was long gone. His mother was in and out of drug rehab. Right. In his file from the public school system, he'd been in 11 different schools in nine years. Right. His measured IQ was 80. His ability to learn placed him in the sixth percentile, meaning that 94%, 93% of other students had a higher ability to learn than he did. He repeated first and second grade. Right. He made it through fourth grade, even though he performed uh, really <laughs> just terribly. He he uh, never even attended third grade. He was basically non-verbal, right? He was without parenting throughout his childhood until the Tuies came along, right? Uh, his mother was just disappearing constantly to feed her addiction to crack cocaine, right? She and her seventh boy slept in an old Chevy, washing themselves in a service station bathroom for weeks on end. For five years, he lived in various households in a housing project, number of two-parent families in this housing project is zero, right? He didn't know what the ocean was. He didn't know what a bird's nest was. He didn't know what the tooth fairy was. But this Christian family came along and effectively adopted him, right? Now, you see this article on ESPN. Blindside subject Michael O'Hare alleges that the Tuies made millions off a lie, all right? Retired NFL star Michael O'Hare his supposed adoption out of grinding poverty by a wealthy white family was immortalized in 2009 movie The Blind Side, petitioned a Tennessee court Monday with allegations that a central element of the story was a lie concocted by the family to enrich itself at his expense. It's such a dangerous thing to help people, particularly under owners, because what happens when you reach out to try to help a wounded animal is very likely to bite you. So this 14-page petition alleges that the Tuies never formally adopted him. Well, many of my warmest memories have been about being unofficially adopted by various families, right? I didn't need have been or seek for them to adopt me formally, right? Uh, you can be adopted without it being a formal adoption. So maybe information will come out that this family took great advantage of him, but count me as highly suspicious. This kid's life was an absolute wreck. It was a mess. He was on track to an early grave. Like nothing good was going to happen to him with the trajectory that he was on. And this family came along and rescued him and effectively adopted him in practice, though not formally, apparently. And he is now suing them. And maybe he has good basis to, to sue him, but I, I don't know all the facts. But on the face of it, this just seems absolutely outrageous. Uh, to think as a convert to Orthodox Judaism, I've effectively been adopted by the Orthodox Jewish community, right? This is a tribe that has taken me in and adopted me. I, I have been adopted into various families in the course of my life uh, without being formally adopted. The idea that you're not adopted unless it's a formal legal paperwork filing is absurd, and the, the grim trajectory of this guy's life, all right? And apparently, he's really upset. It burned him that the movie portrayed him as stupid, right? So he took a Wunderlich test and apparently scored at 19, which equates to an IQ of 95. The, the, the book, The Blind Side, says he had an IQ of 80. We have other psychologists saying that he had an IQ of 100 to 110. So... If he had an IQ of around 100, and given the utter dysfunction of his childhood, right, he was highly unlikely to be on any sort of positive direction for his life. And this family came along and 
effectively, if not legally, adopted him and, and gave him the possibility of a great life that it's just impossible to believe that he could have ever achieved anything like what he achieved without this family. But he's mad. It burns him up that the, the book and the, the movie portray him as unintelligent. Well, he's no mental giant. My God. All right, I'd be curious to see what happens to this story. Okay, so I'm interested in how a diagnosis becomes a battleground for power. All right, so doctors have effectively owned the child abuse diagnosis. All right, prior to 1962, there was no terminology for child abuse. And Stephen Turner writes about this kind of... Uh, fighting for, for power and prestige in his 2013 book, The Politics of Expertise. He references Ian Hacking's classic paper on child abuse from 1991. So you get the triumph here of an expanded concept of child abuse. So anything less than maximizing a child's flourishing now gets diagnosed as child abuse, right? You have the successful imposition of a definition, all right, of child abuse, that serves the interests of a certain professional group, doctors, right? Doctors got to own the area of child abuse, right? So Ian Hacking writes that uh, no one really talked about child abuse until doctors took up the cause in 1962. And so they've gotten to define what is child abuse. Now we have the concept of trauma, which has just taken over the psychology profession. So everybody's got trauma, people on the right, people on the left, everyone's got trauma. And the answer to virtually everything that ails us is to heal the trauma. And this is New York Magazine. Tell, Tell me, why me why it hurts. It hurts. Written by Danielle Carr. It's bad news when your university creates a committee to ensure that you don't publish any research papers without its approval. It's worse news if the only other person facing similar scrutiny is a man investigating alien abductions. This was the situation facing the trauma researcher Bessel van der Kolk in the mid-90s when Harvard Medical School informed him that all of his future publications would be vetted for quality control. The other professor Harvard had slapped with a similar degree of oversight was psychiatrist John Mack, who had spent years studying people who claimed to have been taken by aliens and, by the mid-90s, ended up believing them. At the time, van der Kolk was in his early fifties and an academic star who looked the part, tall and winsomely thatched behind rimless glasses. There was a sense that Mac and I were doing research that was equally wacky, van der Kolk recalled. They did have one thing in common. Both studied people who claimed to have had experiences the scientists couldn't definitively... Okay, so we're waiting, waiting to find out about the Georgia indictment of Trump. This court operation is so incompetent that they, they posted documents about Trump's indictment like hours before they were supposed to and then had to remove them from the website. I mean, one of the, the worst things you can do in the legal profession is to make public things that uh, shouldn't be made public. Remember how Alex's Jones attorney just completely screwed him over by disclosing to the other side all, this, you know, all these damaging text messages that he'd sent. So uh, shockingly, this Georgia court does not seem to be particularly competent. Maybe they're suffering from trauma. Verify. But while Mac's subjects gave detailed accounts of their alien encounters, van der Kolk's patients had memories of horror that were more like fragments than coherent narratives, details that could lurch suddenly out of a dimly remembered past. The car radio jingle that was playing before the explosion, the smell of the dollar store deodorant he was wearing. These shards could hurl patients back into a state of panic, Traumatic memory, van der Kolk argued, is not so much a narrative about the past. It is a literal state of the body. So the more you incentivize people to be traumatized, the more you incentivize people to be pathetic, right? The more people will be pathetic and traumatized. We are heavily incentivizing people to claim trauma and disability. Right? The more you reward disability, the more disability you get. One that can bypass conscious recall only to resurface years later. 
This was the core of van der Kolk's thesis. Traumatic memories are not ordinary memories. But then, trauma science is not ordinary science. By 1995, debates within... Okay, so with regard to personality disorders, right, there's no blood test, right, for almost all psychiatric disorders. There's no objective test to establish whether or not you have them, right? It's a highly subjective operation, largely about expanding power and expanding prestige and expanding the ability to make money. Traumatology had ignited a culture war that was beginning to devolve into a circus, Pruned of nuance by daytime shows like Oprah and Phil Donahue, van der Kolkian theories of traumatic dissociation had transmogrified into the recovered memory movement, in which masses of people, from well-meaning therapists to opportunistic grifters, coalesced around the idea that distinct memories of abuse could surface wholesale many years later. As the idea of recovered memories went mainstream, growing ranks of middle-class women came to identify as... Right, the more you reward hysteria, the more hysteria you get. The more you reward chronic fatigue, the more fatigue you get. The more you reward victimization, the more victimization you get. The more you give to the homeless, the more homeless you get. It's traumatized, often by claiming to have resurfaced recollections of childhood sexual abuse. Patients with multiple personality disorder, with their shrink-slash-co-author-slash-agents in tow, sprang up to furnish harrowing accounts of the torture they had endured as children. Now, it turns out there's really no such thing as multiple personality disorder. People went to jail. It was fantastic television. Skeptics thundered that it was all gender radicalism and bullshit science, a culture of victimization, political correctness gone mad. As one of the researchers whose ideas formed a linchpin of the recovered memory camp, van der Kolk was vulnerable to the backlash. After the psychiatry department closed down the trauma clinic he had spent 12 years building and put the quality control order on his publications, van der Kolk stormed out of Harvard shoulders chipped, and with a determination to bend psychiatric orthodoxy back in his direction. And he largely succeeded in doing that. But whether that's a good thing is a different question. Nearly three decades after leaving Harvard, van der Kolk is currently the world's most famous living psychiatrist and the author of The Body Keeps the Score, which has spent 248 weeks on the New York Times paperback nonfiction bestseller list and counting. To date, it's sold 3 million copies and been translated into 37 languages. Published by Penguin in 2014, The Body Keeps the Score is van der Kolk's manifesto. It argues that trauma constitutes a special type of memory, one distinct from the systems used to remember grocery lists or the name of your childhood pet. Ordinary memories are representations of the past that can change and fade over the course of ordinary life, his argument goes, while trauma is a literal incursion of the past into the present which can produce physiological effects whether or not the traumatized person consciously remembers the event. What this means is that the... So someone in the chat says, I only trust Christ. Well, how do you know what Christ says and how those words would apply to today? You don't. You have to rely on other people. So when you say you only trust Christ, that is impossible. You have to rely on a tradition, and then you have to rely on people wiser than you on how to interpret and implement the tradition in changing times. The body can register what happened in a way the person might catch up to only years later. Even after the traumatic... So this is a, a thesis that cannot be disproved, right? It's one of those non-falsifiable ideas, right? And usually ideas that are falsifiable, hypotheses that are falsifiable are more credible. The event is over, the van der Kolkian model goes, the body stays on alert, reliving the threat of a now non-existent danger. The body keeps the score, isn't the... Right, you want your reactions to stimuli to be broadly aligned with your best interests, right? You don't want to overreact or underreact to danger. You don't want to overreact or underreact to opportunity. You don't want to be overly activated or to be, you know, underactivated. 
for whatever opportunities and problems and situations present themselves to you. The kind of title you would expect to achieve cult status. It's a technically dense overview of a theory of traumatic stress that once spurred 20 years of scientific controversy. After a respectable performance following its publication, The Body Keeps the Score began a st- So Holocaust survivors, by and large, went on to the type of life results that people who didn't undergo the Holocaust but had similar genetics, all right, achieved, all right? So for, for most trauma, right, for virtually all trauma, the evidence suggests that most people go on to life results that they would have had even if the trauma never occurred. Steady climb in the publisher's charts and its prominence, dating to roughly 2018, could not be attributed only to the COVID-generated surge in self-help titles. Somewhere along the way, during the Trump years, among the heady thrashings of me... So I've read hundreds of self-help books, and I've tried to implement uh, probably several dozen self-help books. Uh, I didn't get 5% of the value that I got from implementing the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Me too, and the soul-searching doldrums of the lockdowns and the average listener of the daily discovering white supremacy, trauma became the inflationary currency through which we transact our lives. Look one way, and Prince Harry is live-streaming an interview about the trauma he incurred as a member of a hereditary monarchy. So I remember going through school, all right, and I only went to private school through ninth grade, and every year it seemed like some new fad was flowing through schooling. And, and so, so too with you know, much of the world, much of the hullabaloo, much of you know, what's hot, much of what dominates us is just fatuous nonsense, whether it's in education or in psychology or a lot of these other female-dominated professions. Look the other, and books like Arlene Geronimus's Weathering are arguing that the violence experienced by America's impoverished, racialized underclass should be understood as trauma passed down epigenetically across generations. Within the gulf separating a British prince and, say, a poor black teenager on Chicago's south side, lies the vast range of human experience that increasingly seems to fall within the ambit of trauma. Yeah, and there's, there's no evidence that there are any statistical correlations to experiencing trauma. It, it, generally speaking, most people who experience trauma go under the same life results right, as those who don't experience trauma once you take genetics into consideration. In his ascent, Van der Kolk has done for trauma what Carl Sagan did for the galaxy. Today... Yes, I did read I'm okay, you're okay. I don't remember much about it. I think I read it like 40 years ago. The prevalent trauma concept is fundamentally Van der Kolkian. Trauma as a state of the body, rather than a way of interpreting the past. This... Okay, this is profound, all right. In today's modern, enlightened world, we put a great deal more store on reason than reason deserves. Because before we can think, before we can reason, right, we, we have these reactions that are precognitive. Right? And so our reactions to life and the way we use reason is far more profoundly affected by our genetics, by our imprinting, and by all sorts of forces that we're not conscious about than, generally speaking, by whatever we can achieve through our reason. This means that getting the patient unstuck from the past requires... So one way of understanding the difference between conservatives and liberals, the right and the left, is the right has a much keener sense that, you know, our reason takes place within the body, and the body is not, you know, a, a, an, an organ, a, a physicality, that is primarily constituted to do, you know, kindness and goodness and decency and truth, right? So people on the right all have a skeptical, suspicious view of human nature, and they understand that our reasoning faculties take place within our, you know, needy, flawed, lustful, uh, frequently violent, rageful body. While the left, you know, values reason to a much greater extent than does the right, and believes that we can create, you know, autonomous, 
Buffett lives based on our reasoning strategic abilities. Requires working with the body and teaching it to unbrace itself from a chronic fight or flight mode. Last summer, I met Vanderkolk at an ashram in the Berkshires to attend his. So when you're in fight or fl flight mode, that shows itself in the body, all right? Fight and flight is, you know, the head's going, rotating forward, the, the shoulders are rising up, the head's also simultaneously going forward and tipping back, compressing the neck. So you can see people in fight and flight mode. It's uh, not a great way to live. His week-long trauma workshop. The program, which he has given hundreds of times in various forms in dozens of countries, combines lectures drawn from The Body Keeps the Score with healing exercises led so a main criteria for criteria for Donald Trump choosing his attorneys is are they attractive you know young and female led by Leisha Skye a body worker and Vander Kolk's wife of 10 years our first evening began with what the two of them swiftly correcting someone who used the word icebreakers dubbed the work such exercises as mirroring breath and gait with strangers, making eye contact that bordered on the harrowing, accepting an invitation to dance, or, in my case, noticing and sensing what this invitation to dance brings up. So out of all the systems of which I'm aware, Alexander Technique offers the best tools and the most effective and useful approach for noticing one's reactions to stimuli and learning to let go of those reactions that don't serve you. I, I think the Alexander technique is frequently far more effective than the techniques alluded to in this article from New York Magazine. Maybe a feeling of refusal. The end of the night found attendees sprawled across the thrilled to exhausted spectrum, depending on how their bodies had kept the score for the past hour and a half. Today, Van der Kolk's renown, built on translating neuroscience into language accessible to people searching for a cure for their pain, has placed him in a position straddling scientific celebrity and guru. On the first night, every attendee who took the mic, the therapists, school counselors, and medical professionals, some of whom had the tuition comped by their employers, admitted they had come... Okay, so who is Bessel van der Kolk? What does he sound like and look all like? just a part of our time, and we get defined by our time. And um, we sort of, my colleagues and I sort of invented this trauma stuff in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And then we thought that the world would become a better place. In fact, we have that over here. We thought the world would become a better place. And instead of becoming a better place, it became more and more prescriptive. We got an insane diagnostic system that ignores the reality of people's lives. We got an insane diagnostic system that ignores the fact that we are all parts of a large universe, that we are part of each other, that the way you behave affects the way that I am, and that most mental illness is a result of um, the environment and the individual being at odds with each other. And um, so in some ways, it didn't work out very well. And maybe first, discovered this issue of trauma, we had this wonderful childlike naive notion of the world that I see now again in my postdocs who are wonderful, naive and young and lovely and hardworking and energetic. Yeah, everyone else is deluded and uh, naive here, but the good doctor. Come for their own healing as well. Later, when I asked two special education teachers how they had learned about van der Kolk, they laughed. If you're in a certain line of work, it doesn't really make sense to ask us how we've heard of Bessel van der Kolk. For people in trauma-informed care, they explained, referring to the professions stretching from schools to hospitals to social work programs to parole offices to private psychotherapy practices, he's like a god. But well into this echelon of success, van der Kolk remains palpably embattled, that first night, one attendee joked that, like everyone else there, he had come to learn from his high holiness here, the holy man of trauma. So he's embattled. He's, he's the victim. All right. It'd become incredibly, incredibly successful beyond the wildest dreams of 99.9999% of psychiatrists. And yet he feels victimized and embattled. He gestured at Vanderkolk, who was seated on the ashram's dais. Don't call me that, 
Vanderkolk snapped back, suddenly on edge. I'm not a holy man. In response to questions indicating less than total buy-in, he may give the sense that he's not exactly talking to you. It's more like he's letting you listen in while he corrects the errors of some invisible antagonist. No, I mean, that's true for so many live streamers and gurus. All right, they're, they're talking at you. They're not really talking with you. They're, they're just instructing you. That's what it was like, generally speaking, to converse with my father. Right? He was really only there to instruct you. If you weren't open to his instruction, then he was completely at loss how to relate to you. Nobody's getting healed here this week. He right, so people like uh, this guy, my father, a lot of other gurus, they're far less interested in having friends than in having followers. Muttered when surveying the first day registration fracas in the lobby earlier. People come thinking I'm going to fix them, but trauma doesn't... Oh, no one's getting healed today. We have no idea what could be healing. I could make some stray comment that I don't think about at all and it could have a profoundly transformative and healing effect on you on the other hand i could work for days weeks and months on something and uh, it just lands and makes absolutely no difference so we don't know always what's going to heal and what's not going to heal well i can just look at the chat guys i can tell no one's going to get healed here tonight and the fault is all with you it doesn't work like that just because a war is over, the Vanderkolkian theory goes, doesn't mean its veterans won't be left battling flashbacks. Bessel Vanderkolk is a veteran of a strange type of war. Vanderkolk didn't set out to study trauma. So why would someone think he's a victim of a war? Because that makes him more heroic. All right, he he is part of the you know the classic hero paradigm. He's going to war against the forces of darkness. When he landed as an undergraduate at the University of Hawaii in 1962, he told me he was mainly interested in surfing, meeting girls, and learning how to dance the hula. Born in July 1943 in the Nazi-occupied Hague, he arrived to devastation. He was the middle child of five and sickly. His father, who worked for Shell Oil, had been caught in one of the Nazis' mass roundups of able. So think about how well many countries did after they were absolutely smashed and destroyed by World War II. I mean, Germany rebuilt so quickly and effectively. Japan rebuilt so quickly and effectively. Uh, Holland rebuilt so quickly and effectively. And then other nations, which have never endured anything like the trauma that uh, Germany and Japan and Holland suffered during World War II, they're uh, still sewers. Maybe it has something to do with the quality of the people rather than outside circumstance, rather than trauma. ...bodied men and sent to a work zone. His mother played piano, and each child learned an instrument. Bessel played piano and cello. Our mother wasn't prepared for the demands of a large family, his younger brother Jan told me. When I well, guess what? You know, virtually no parent is prepared for the demands of parenting, and certainly no parent is prepared for the demands of a large family. I mean, some therapists make it a really good argument that if you grew up in a large family, you would have endured you know, not very much parental attention, right? Because your parents would just simply be too tired just trying to survive and just trying to corral everybody. So I'm sure there's a tremendous toll paid by those who grow up in a large family in very little individual parental affection. But overall, how parents parent you, that there's no statistical evidence that any noble parenting style pays off in any statistical verifiable result. What shapes quality of your life is primarily your genetics and secondarily your peer group. I ask Vanderkolk about his childhood. He doesn't mention any of this. Instead, he tells me about receiving an excellent education in the Netherlands, where he learned to speak six languages and to love classical music. He came to the U.S. to stay with his uncle, a professor at the University of Hawaii, who then left the following year. To pay his bills and tuition, Vanderkolk spent several summers as a ward attendant in an asylum, an experience that moved him to devote his life to the field of psychiatry. 
As an undergraduate, van der Kolk was active in Students for a Democratic Society, and by the late 1960s, it was a mainstream, new-left position that mental hospitals were little more than prisons by another name. So what type of people get attracted to a career in psychiatry or a career in teaching the Alexander Technique? I would suspect it's disproportionately people who come from a background of great pain who are looking for healing for themselves. Right? That's not to put down Alexander Technique teachers such as myself or psychiatrists, but just to provide a tapestry of meaning and understanding over these professions and the type of people who are attracted to them. He was also deeply influenced by thinkers in the anti-psychiatry movement, such as R.D. Lang, and by mentors who emphasized non-medical causes of mental distress. In this model, treating the patient meant treating their social situation as well. When van der Kolk was beginning his research career, working with patients at the Boston VA outpatient clinic, a struggle was brewing about whether trauma research could become a legitimate biomedical field. Yeah, so obviously the situation a person finds himself in will be tremendously important. All right, here is video of the man himself. Let me see that they can solve things. And so I thought by just having this trauma stuff that the world would become a better place. That notion came to an end in February 2003 when the U.S. bombed the shit out of the city of Baghdad. Oh, so this whole you know, psychiatric uh, diagnosis, all right, it, it just got uh, obliterated, all right? The trajectory of trauma research got obliterated because of some foreign policy decision primarily made by the George W. Bush administration, right? Doesn't seem like a terribly compelling argument to me. Since its first appearance in psychoanalytic consulting rooms, trauma had eluded definition as a coherent neurological disease, the controversy centered on whether post-traumatic stress disorder would become a... So apparently Donald Trump has received 10 indictments out of Georgia, and on Fox News they're about to offer Mark Levin's commentary. I just can't wait for that. ...psychiatric diagnosis. In the lead-up to the publication of the third edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 1980... Vietnam veterans' advocacy groups united with psychiatrists who opposed the Vietnam War. This group... So PTSD is the one psychiatric diagnosis that, is, that, that requires a, a social situational context. So if you're sad about losing a relationship, uh, losing a job, losing status, right? if you're sad for more than three months about this kind of loss, then you are medically sick with depression. That's, that's the dominant psychiatric framework. But uh, it doesn't take into, into account that uh, sadness can frequently be healthy, a healthy, normal reaction to loss. PTSD is unusual among all psy psychiatric diagnoses. ...wanted PTSD to make it into the dsm 3 so the state would cover treatment for veterans' psychological injuries. Yeah, so much of psychiatry, perhaps most of psychiatry, revolves around how does our profession get more power, more money, and more prestige? How can we get insurance companies to pay for what we have to offer? How can we convince a wider range of people that they need our services? How can we make more money from pushing uh, prescriptions for pharmacology? nightmares, sudden rages, a proclivity to substance abuse. This pro-PTSD camp saw trauma as something embedded in social and political problems outside the patient's body. Opposing them was the faction of psychiatrists controlling the dsm 3 committees who had bet the house on biological reductionism, or the idea that psychiatric diagnoses are ultimately brain disorders. To this faction, the dsm 3 was supposed to act as psychiatry's coming of age as a legitimate medical science, inaugurating a unified system of diagnosis that everyone, from neurosurgeons to insurance companies, could agree on. To them, it was humiliating that other branches of medicine had sailed through the 20th century discovering magic bullet cure. So psychiatry is the least prestigious, least well-paid version of medicine uh, has the, the fewest you know replicable 
results and insights and scientific backing, all right? It is the least scientific of all the medical disciplines, and medicine overall is not a science. It contains elements of science, but it's just as much a, a craft like being a plumber. Cures, while psychiatry hardly had even a basic understanding of the biological basis of mental illness. The PTSD skeptics on the committees wanted nothing to do with any diagnosis that they suspected lacked the same kind of biological reality. Right, so they want diagnoses that are prestigious, that have the advantages of you know, a scientific sound or, or feel to them that will enable them to make more money, get more people buying in, more insurance companies pouring more money in what they have to offer. For example, in all Obama pl plans, Every insurance type of ins health insurance has to offer you know, a minimum of $2,000 a day coverage for drug rehab or addiction rehab facilities. And remember, rehab facilities only make money if you keep coming back. They only make money if they don't work very well. Right? If you work the 12 steps, right, you don't have to go to rehab. Right? There's no money to be made from working the 12 steps. Rehabs only make money if they don't do a very good job. Right? If they do enough of a good job to offer you some improvement, but if they show you a path to health, right, you'll never go back to the rehab, and the rehab won't money make money. So we've got a system you know, funding rehab. Every form of health insurance has to fund rehab a minimum of $2,000 a day, even though the whole business model of addiction rehab is that uh, you don't cure people because then they won't come back. Of diseases like polio or hypertension. Even Freud's original formulation of trauma had been troubled by a crucial indeterminacy. Did trauma come from something that occurred outside the individual's psyche, say, an explosion or a railway accident, or inside it? Well, given that identical traumas you know, happen frequently to thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of people, and statistically there are no difference in life results after that trauma, Obviously, it's not primarily about uh, you know, the, the social outside condition of, of the trauma. It's about the particular combination of, of genes and imprinting and whatever's going on with that rare individual who becomes malformed by the trauma. A neurotic complex triggered by an external event. Trauma, in other words, seemed to beg the central question... Does trauma happen when stress tips over some acute threshold, or are people traumatized because of some underlying vulnerability that makes trauma out of what, for someone else, might just be stress? I think that there are probably hundreds of thousands of people who make a living in the rehab industry, and the whole industry depends upon not being very effective, right? The whole industry is essentially a con a con game, and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people make their living from participating in this con. It's like chiropractic, right? Uh, the, the evidence is overwhelming that chiropractic is at best useless, uh, frequently dangerous and deadly, but the chiropractic profession, like the psychiatric profession, has banded together, lobbied very effectively to leech from the government and from the general public tens of billions of dollars frequently doing no good whatsoever, uh, often doing harm. Is trauma even a useful concept scientifically? Ultimately, the strength of the grassroots campaign for PTSD, coupled with the undeniable symptoms psychiatrists were seeing in veterans, forced the skeptics to cave. PTSD became an official diagnosis in the dsm 3 the central and why did it become an official diagnosis? Because there was a lot of money to be made, right? They needed this diagnosis to get access to insurance company millions and billions of dollars. Well, indeterminacy about what trauma actually is, however, continued unresolved. In the 80s and 90s, van der Kolk told me, repeating a line he's fond of, Boston was for trauma studies what Vienna was for music. He had married Elizabeth Betta de Boer, a Dutch au pair who would become a social worker. Their first child, Hannah, was born, then Nick. Every day, van der Kolk would bike from their brownstone in the South End to work at Massachusetts General, 
one of Harvard's teaching hospitals. By the mid-1980s, a small but powerful coalition of psychiatric researchers was taking shape to steer what PTSD would mean. So a great way of decoding things is to understand what are the incentives operating. All right, I am incentivized to tell you incredible things that you won't find in the mainstream media, to push ideas and theories that you won't find in the mainstream media that would then justify you coming to my show and to give you something exciting and a spectacle. Right? These things are probably not true and not good for you, but those are the incentives of the live streamer. So too, the incentives of members of professions such as psychiatry the incentives are to increase one's power and prestige and money-making opportunities, right? not necessarily aligned with what is true and what is good. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, Vanderkolk was the ringleader of this network. For more than 10 years, the Harvard Trauma Study Group met every month, forming the first stronghold of what its enemies would later call the traumatologists. In 1984, Vanderkolk published his first trauma paper. So if there's money, prestige, power, and status from pushing trauma or pushing uh, crystals, the healing power of aura, reading, right, uh, a lot of people go into it. It contained the seed from which all his future work would develop. In it, he argued that the nightmares veterans were having weren't like normal nightmares. They came earlier in the sleep cycle and were repetitive dreams that were usually exact replicas of actual combat events. So when Michael Eisner, the former head of Disney, would hear about someone else who's had a heart attack, Eisner would be competitive about it and say, well, your heart attack wasn't mu like mine. Mine was massive. My, my heart attack was bigger. <laughs> my theory is bigger. You know, I've got uh, a greater hold of the truth, right? Not to diss Michael Eisner here, just talking about how people operate particularly men. That is, unlike normal dreams, which fuse memories, wishes, and anxieties, PTSD nightmares are a literal replay of the traumatic event itself. At a biological level, Vanderkolk would soon argue, this implied that trauma is physically seared into the nervous system, more like a scar than a story. This was a big claim, if it was true, it meant trauma could act as a kind of objective proof that something had happened. A person can lie, but the body cannot. Vanderkolk set out to determine what kind of physiological system could account for this type of body memory. Wow, maybe the body, the body keeps the score. The brain, the mind, and the body all in the healing of trauma. Yeah. Here he is, the great because man. Because we were angry about what happened in 9-11 and killed 200,000 people who had nothing to do with uh, the attack of the World Trade Center. For me, that was sort of the low point of my life and of my work. Because a few months... Why would Bush administration's decision to invade Iraq in 2003, a decision over which you have absolutely no power and influence, why on earth would that be the low point of your life? Right? Considering the millions of people have been murdered and tortured, like, why would you choose that as, as the low point of your life? Right, that's the, the trauma man. In an extraordinary paper from 1985, he proposed the first neurobiological model for PTSD, one that could explain why trauma victims so often return to situations in which the traumatic experience will likely repeat. So this vessel, Van der Kolk, he, he reminds me of those Jews and those rabbis who say, oh, you know, I've stopped keeping the Sabbath or I've stopped putting on to fill in or I can no longer believe in God because of the Holocaust, right? So tens of millions of non-Jews get murdered, get tortured, get raped, get slaughtered, right? Meet with, you know, horrible, horrible things. But that doesn't affect their belief in God. But when it happens to Jews, then their faith, then their practice, right? Then it goes out the window if it happens to Jews. Freud had called this the repetition compulsion, when animals are continually subjected to inescapable shocks, it triggers a stress response that includes the release of endogenous opioids as an analgesic. So one way that you can tell you're dealing with a guru is when they make all sorts of you know, passionate, heartfelt, dramatic statements on topics that they know nothing about, such as the author here of The Body Keeps the Score. Once before, I also had written an op-ed article in which I said, you know, you can choose to go to war. Uh, governments can just kill people. 
But I have to tell you, we know something about what it does to people. If you go to war, more people will kill themselves after coming home than will be killed on the battlefield. Yeah, and what happens if you don't go to war, right? Sometimes the results of not going to war are more horrific than actually going to war. When the stressor ends, van der Kolk hypothesized, it could cause an opioid withdrawal effect, which the stressed subject might try to fix by seeking re-exposure to the stressor. Perhaps, he posited, chronic exposure to stress created trauma junkies addicted to the high of endogenous opioids. Maybe this was why, for instance, abused children often grow up to choose violent partners. Or people with a certain set of genetics are more likely to commit violence. This 1985 paper contained all the signature features of van der Kolkian trauma. Most notably, it synthesized the two factions that had clashed over the PTSD diagnosis. From the biological reductionist camp, it took the idea that trauma is a literal state of the body. And from the veterans activists, it took the premise that trauma is caused by social and political violence and would therefore need more than medication to treat. By the late 80s, van der Kolk was collaborating with Harvard psychiatrist Judith Herman another founding member of the Harvard Trauma Study Group. Okay, question in the chat. Hey, I'm up for jury duty. Any tips? It's unpaid in Canada. I'm not feeling very incentivized. So when you get to be part of a jury of your peers, right, that's one experience. When you serve on a jury and because the defendant is of one strongly identifying in-group and there are several members of the jury who are also that strongly identifying in-group, and they believe that enough members of their in-group are already in prison, and even though the evidence is overwhelming, they will not vote to convict this, you know, obviously guilty man. Uh, that makes serving on a jury rather dispiriting. So perhaps those institutions and rules and customs that worked in a relatively homogeneous society don't work, such as the jury system, when, uh, say, you've got you know, members of an in-group who won't vote to convict another member of an in-group. So perhaps we need to shift away from the jury system and have judges make decisions rather than juries. Herman was one of the first people to research father-daughter incest, and her findings indicated that a vast conspiracy of silence was hiding the extent of domestic abuse nationwide. With Herman, he began to develop a model arguing that borderline personality disorder, a diagnosis overwhelmingly assigned to women with a history of abuse, was, in fact, a form of post-traumatic adaptation. Or so most therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists don't want to deal with borderlines. They don't have very much success. You've got borderlines in your life. Look, if you've got anyone with a personality disorder in your life, you're overwhelmingly better off minimizing all contact when you have to have contact just gray rocking them meaning just give the minimal responses you know provide them the fewest you know incentives to interact with you bad people make you feel bad to the extent possible avoid bad people good people make you feel good you know increase the number of good people in your life or what herman would eventually term complex ptsd the borderline patient's dysregulated emotions were equivalent to a combat veteran's flashbacks, they argued, while her fragmented or missing memories were similar to the veteran's disordered experience of time. As clinicians, the two researchers also began seeing women who, as adults, had come to understand that the So theory is all well and good. The most important thing about theory, though, is does it replicate and... Is it predictive and does it uh, explain things in a way that's powerful and enables, you know, in, in the field of psychology, you know, people to heal, right? Theory is all well and good, but what's the bottom line here, guys? How does it work? They were sexually assaulted as children. In most cases, the patients knew the gist of what had happened, though without remembering specifics. There was Carmen, a 21-year-old who had accused her father of assaulting her as a child, who, in treatment, recalled more specific memories that she hid from her family. In some cases, patients in treatment would... 
So I think psychiatry does more benefit than harm. I, I'd give a ratio of probably 70 to 30, but it might be as low as 60 to 40. I mean, psychiatry and the whole you know, therapeutic profession has you know, soaked up a lot of dollars. Uh, overall, I, I think it does more good than harm, but it's not an overwhelming ratio. Would dredge up memories of previously forgotten episodes. In a 1987 book, Vanderkolk wrote about a 30-year-old woman plagued by crippling insecurity, compulsive behaviors, and endocrinological abnormalities. By the eighth week of therapy, she was suddenly recalling in graphic detail a traumatic incident of being assaulted by her. So I was crippled by poor health. You know, virtually all my life, particularly most dramatically in my 20s, or essentially bedridden for six years. Probably did have some medical professionals urge me to eat meat, but I couldn't hear them. So to whatever extent I heard that, I couldn't hear it. You know, I certainly got that feedback from a lot of people. So I, I'm sure it's a very common frustration, right? You see what's obviously wrong with someone. And so, you know, I went through my life crippled because I couldn't listen to the single piece of advice that I was most often given. You really need to eat meat. Her seventh grade classmates in a so, I, I mean, I finally overcame it by taking beef organ capsules. I can just swallow the capsules and I don't have to force myself to eat something that I've never eaten in my life. Vacant lot. Herman and Vanderkolk began trying to understand why a person who had been assaulted earlier in life might not remember it until later. One of their hypotheses was that, as a child, the patient wouldn't have known assault was the name of the thing happening to them. Another hypothesis was that the survivor's body had sealed the memory off from conscious awareness and stored it in another part of the nervous system. Okay, very compelling thesis. This guy has made quite the livelihood off it. Here he is. Because it happens in every fucking war. Um, you can go to war, but the people who come home, many of them, will, it will be almost impossible for them to have loving, intimate relationships with their loved ones and their yeah, but statistically speaking, is, is this true, right? Do they statistically, is there statistically a dramatic difference in the life results of people who go to war versus men with, with similar genetics who do not? I'm not sure the evidence is so clear here. Kids, because being at war tends to destroy that capacity in people. Um, yeah, and, you know, working a, a dead-end job, right? Many men remember going to war as the most intense, the most strongly connected, bonded, the most alive that they ever feel. Now, I'm not endorsing going to war, but there is often a sense of, of connection and bonding and higher purpose and meaning that people gain from it. If the second hypothesis were true, the traumatologists argued, it would suggest the presence of two memory systems, the everyday one and the traumatic body memory. By the late 80s, Vanderkolk's traumatologist camp had produced some clues that a second memory system might exist. So one thing I noticed as an Alexander Technique teacher is people tend to pile on body tension, compression, and you know, other habits just on top of each other rather than subtracting the unhelpful adaptions to stimuli that they've developed, such as you know, jutting their head forward, and allowing their shoulders to rise up, or compressing their neck, or all the weird interfering, tightening, compressing, pulling down habits that, that people have. It all seems to just build on each other, build on each other. And so generally speaking, men are much more difficult to work with than women because men live much more in an abstract world than women. Older people much more difficult to work with than younger people. Back to this article from New York Magazine. But as for a coherent biological model, they just didn't have it. In the absence of a robust neurobiological model, the traumatologists cast about for other explanations. One they leaned on was dissociation, or the notion that trauma could fragment someone's experience so drastically that entire swaths of memory would break off, plaguing the traumatized person until the memory was recovered and integrated. At the time, Scientists did not agree on whether it was possible to recover memories that had been suppressed or lost in traumatic dissociation, but as long as the debate stayed in the academy, things remained civil. 
The fusillade started when, in the late 80s, the academics began serving as expert witnesses in recovered memory lawsuits. As a traumatologist luminary, Vanderkolk served as an expert witness for the prosecution in a series of clerical abuse cases brought. So you make a ton of money serving as an expert witness. You are strongly incentivized to take on gigs as an expert witness. Right? You, you, you'll make $500, $1,000 an hour as a psychiatrist, as an expert witness. ...against the Catholic Church, testifying that it was scientifically plausible that a victim might not remember or recognize abuse until years later. Opposing the traumatologists were researchers like Elizabeth Loftus and Richard McNally, who argued that, actually, memory does work in a pretty straightforward way. Yeah, and the more realistic side was right, and the Bessel van der Kolk traumatologist side was wrong, ruining the lives of thousands and thousands of people. As the controversy over recovered memories traveled from the courtroom to the paperback market to, eventually, the talk show circuit, the movement began looking more like the bad-faith gloss given by its critics. Things were starting to get pulpy. Self-help blockbusters such as Ellen Bass and Laura Davis's 1988 The Courage to Heal listed relatively vague and common symptoms— fatigue, anxiety, difficulty remembering early childhood, as evidence that the reader was repressing memories of childhood sexual abuse. Mental health care providers, many of them licensed social workers, swung out with eyes peeled for signs of repressed memories of sexual abuse, often using methods like hypnotherapy. Some people became... So I've had friends who are licensed clinical social workers who are very convinced that I came from a you know, a background of, of, you know, horrific child abuse. And, uh, you know, I was certainly smacked around, you know, bounced off walls, but uh, thank God they were sexually abused. Certain they had been sexually abused as children. A 1980 memoir, Michelle Remembers, co-written by a Canadian psychiatrist and his patient, and subsequently wife, Michelle Smith, detailed tales of grotesque, satanic, ritual child abuse. The book was later thoroughly debunked. The traumatologists tried to establish distance between their research and the voyeuristic excesses of its popularization. Many clinicians, van der Kolk wrote in 1997, seem to have suspended their capacity for doubt and skepticism by uncritically accepting as true all stories of sexual or satanic abuse in their patients— but by the early 90s, the idea of repressed memories had escaped its theoretical origins and was running wild through the culture. This was the period in which van der Kolk came under academic scrutiny. If you ask him, he says his push out of Harvard was orchestrated by Mass General's chief of psychiatry, a Jesuit priest who had consulted with the Boston Archdiocese on sex abuse cases— but by the mid-90s, the recovered memory movement was on the back foot. In 1994, anthropologist Jean de Fontaine demonstrated that American specialists were contributing to the rise in satanic abuse allegations internationally. That same year, Harvard Medical School undertook an investigation into the work on recovered memories done by van der Kolk's research assistant. The data was later revealed to have been faked. When traumatology antagonist Richard McNally published Remembering Trauma in 2003, it was a victory lap at the end of the memory wars. Trauma had been reduced to its vulgarization and pronounced junk science. During but, the trauma workshop but. in the Berkshires, van der Kolk often referenced this period in his career, sketching the forces— from the Catholic bureaucracy to the institutional groupthink protecting cognitive behavioral therapy that he sees as having hounded him out of Harvard. Today, at 80, he lives in a large house overlooking a sweep of field and Berkshire's... So grievance-mongering underlies a great deal of what gurus do, including this particular man. Seems like a classic guru. Forest. 
In conversation, he sometimes radiates impatience and is prone to interrupting to give the dialogue the shape he thinks it should take. When I mentioned that I was not convinced by a claim he made in a lecture that a nationwide program of early childhood attachment intervention could end mass incarceration, he told me, matter-of-factly, that I was not qualified to have an opinion. He responds best if you push back a bit, counseled one of his assistants. He can flip between moody exasperation and winning charm. On the first day of the retreat, he picked me up in his Tesla to purchase wine as a treat for his staff. When we arrived at the store minutes after it closed, Vander Kolk glowered at me so darkly I promised to find another one. Later, cautiously, I presented the bottles. Come on up to our rooms with the rest of the team, he said, all warmth. After Harvard closed his trauma clinic in 1994, Vanderkolk left for Boston University Medical School and relocated his trauma center in Brookline, Massachusetts. The center's treatments, ranging from play therapy to internal family systems therapy to meditation, were all rooted in the idea that healing the patient required pulling them out of the dissociative memory system and back into their own body in the present. Within a few years, the center was hosting group therapy sessions for people who had lost someone to suicide, for 8- to 10-year-old abused girls, and for parents who realized their spouse had been molesting their children. At the time, the trauma center's work wasn't fringe so much as a niche psychiatric specialty. This changed after 9-11, which transformed trauma into a national public health crisis. During the Vietnam War, the U.S. government had fought the introduction of the PTSD diagnosis, but the War on Terror found it eager to invoke trauma. National trauma. Right, so trauma becomes you know, dominant when there are incentives to come out with the diagnosis, not because it's been proved to be true, not, not because it's been proved to have predictive value, not because it's been proved to be superior to other ways of dealing with problems, right? It's uh, largely about incentives, how to get money, power, status, prestige, not about actually helping people. Was useful. It allowed the U.S. to frame itself as a victim rather than a global aggressor. And as it became clear that, contrary to the government's promises, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan would not be over soon, veterans' health care became an urgent political concern. Between 2004 and 2012, Department of Defense funding for PTSD skyrocketed from $30 million to $300 million. Right, and not because PTSD is being shown to be a valuable, useful, helpful diagnosis, not because it, it replicates with strong predictive and explanatory value, but because it aligns with the incentives of you know, powerful people who want more power, more money, more prestige, that's the way the world works.